Welcome to the Physique Development Muscle Series. In this special series, we're breaking down the science and art of training each muscle group. Each episode is dedicated to a specific muscle, providing you with expert insight into its function, dispelling common training misconceptions, and highlighting our go-to exercises that deliver results. We'll also share key execution cues to help you perfect your technique and maximize your gains. Get ready to elevate your training game and achieve your fitness goals like never before. Let's dive into delts. I'm really excited to introduce the next guest on this series as he has become a great friend of mine, Dom Kuza. He has his master's in exercise physiology and to no surprise believes in a science-based approach while still understanding that a lifestyle change should be a journey that is both productive and enjoyable. Dom works with competitive physique sport athletes and those just looking to feel better in their bodies. In working with his athletes, he has achieved multiple pro cards and with his professionals, many wins. And alongside of that has helped hundreds of people better their livelihood. He is immersed in education. <laughs> and what I mean this is that he is the educator for Camp Jansen. He is an educator for Raw Supplement Company, Revive Supplement Company, and is in part to the product development for both of those supplement companies. <laughs> Dude is so smart. He has many courses and mentorship that he provides for other coaches. Dom has been an incredible resource for myself and for my clients, and I'm honored to have him on today to talk all things delts, anterior, medial, and posterior. Welcome to the show. You guys are in for an absolute treat today. This is actually Dom's first ever podcast where he's going to be talking about training. Yes, it is. <laughs> Dom is an expert in so many things, and I am shocked as we were going through our research for this podcast that we had no training covered at all in any of your previous podcasts. No, nope. uh, we were talking about it earlier off camera, but every time I'm on a podcast, it's nutrition, it's diuretics, it's PEDs, and it's like you know, education stuff, but I've never like sat and actually just talked about training. So, yeah. so this is it'll be, awesome. be good. Yeah, this is gonna be awesome. Well, today we're digging into delts and this is something where, especially within your main field of work, being competitors, male and female, the massive part of the overall presentation to the physique. Yep. Uh, I think delts are really important because I feel like in most divisions that X frame right. is this, is what they're going for. So I always think as the top tops of the X's, right? What is that? That's your delts. And I think, I think a lot of guys neglect their delts in a way, or I think a lot of guys try to train their delts like directly. I think the delts do well with frequency. Um, and I think women too need to do delts, but I feel like some women overdo their delts okay. more than men do. Yeah. Let's, let's dive into some of that. So if a client is coming to you and they have gotten feedback from the judges of, okay, physique looks good where you're missing the opportunity to gain your pro card, for example, you need to bring up your delts. It's taking away from your physique. Let's let's use the framework of a male client first. Uh, we'll say men's physique. How do you go about addressing that improvement? What are the things that you're kind of highlighting or starting with for that particular client? So with somebody like that, I like frequency, okay, especially for the delts, I think because I mean, through just like anecdotal evidence, my own bodybuilding, I always noticed that they could take a pretty good amount of like set work volume through the week and not really feel like completely battered. Okay. Uh, I also think that has to do with just, you know, how the muscle, the motor units in your delts versus like your quads. Right. Um, and so I like to do frequency when it comes to delts. So I'll put delt work specifically like anterior medial on like push days. I'll put all the rear stuff on pull days. Okay. But I'll also have like rows that are purposely like elbow high, mm -hmm. right? I want you to try to bend the bar around your back, um, you know, things like that. I do think that a lot of guys, as they train more and more and more and they do more pressing, they start to neglect their anterior delt a little too much. Okay. And I think that ends up taking away from like a good curvature, like in a front pose, especially in men's physique. I think like a hands on hip pose. I think you start to lose a lot of that roundness to the delt when that anterior delt gets a little undertrained. Okay. 
like I, I guess like a way I kind of look at it is some people will say things like when you press, it's like a half set of, <laughs> yeah. d- of delts, right? Yeah. So they kind of use that to quantify their volume, but I don't think that's enough direct work. So recently, probably over the last like year and a half, I'll put direct like front delt work in, in my guys' plans just because I noticed that their delts were looking a lot more complete. Okay. So when you, when you talk about frequency... How do you kind of split that up for a, a men's physique competitor? Do you have a a push day, a pull day, and then a full delt session? And do they train five days where they have like two lower body days? How does that work? So men's physique, I usually do something like a chest delt day. Okay. And then like a back rear delt day. I like doing upper days with my men's physique guys too, okay. where they'll do some chest volume, some back volume and then direct delt volume on that day. Uh, I do like, I, I yes, I, I'll, pro, I'll program like an arm day where they're doing buys, tries, and medial delt probably that day. Okay. So usually it looks like a chest delt day, then like a back rear delt day, an arm day, an upper day, and then a leg day too. I do think now, especially with criteria change, these guys are going to have to start training their legs a little bit more. Right. Because the, the shorts are coming up they're going to start judging the bottom, how well you fill out your short. That's all going to be criteria now. They're trying that with the pros this year, and then that'll go. That'll cross over into the amateurs. But okay. I'm sure just sub, subconsciously, those those guys judge both, so they'll be looking. Okay. And so when we when we look at the different exercises, let's say for this male archetype, are there what are some of the favorite exercises that you implement for their delt training to bring them up? Uh, I'm a big fan of things that are chest supported okay. because I like removing momentum as much as I can. I'll, I like doing like maybe like a high incline bench setup, Y raises. Uh, I like doing like reverse pec decks. I'll do like reverse uh, cable flies, but I do like it set up if possible with like a bench all the way up. So they're chest supported against it too. That's the problem with delt work. I think there's too much momentum mm-hmm. usually associated with it. And a lot of people miss the mark on that. I personally love upright rows. A lot of people hate them. Okay. But I think that's just a form thing. I think guys just, guys and girls just tend to, you know, do upright rows incorrectly a lot of the time uh, because I think a good upright row is one of the better delt movements that you can do uh, just because there's so much control of momentum in it. You can get good pauses at the top. You can get good negatives through the motion. There's not that much like swing with with an upright row. So what what's the what's the most common mistake you see people make when they're doing an upright row? I think their hands are too close together. Uh, they lead with their hands over their elbows. I always try to tell people like your hands your hands should be in line with your kind of like nipple line. Uh, your elbows should be sitting higher than your hands. All right, and then if you start to come up too high, now you start to stimulate all of this, right? You shouldn't really be feeling all of your neck muscles, your upper traps when you're doing an upright row. Uh, that was something Mike Isertel taught me because like I've trained with him because he's, he's he actually lives by me now. Oh, really? Yeah, and he had us come and like uh, do a session. It's on YouTube. I got absolutely demolished. Um, <laughs> but we did legs that day in the video, but he was showing us too like some stuff with like upper movements and the upright row is one thing that he showed me that works really well with just taking a little bit wider of a grip, really leading with your with your elbows. Uh, I'm a huge I'm a huge fan of that movement. Do you prefer it with a, an easy bar, a straight bar, cable? Yeah, like a cambered easy yeah, bar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cable or just like a, like those barbell setups. Too. Okay. It's one of those movements I haven't done in a, a long while. Uh, when I was in high school, my strength conditioning coach was obsessed with them. And so we did them a ton and I just, I don't know. I don't have like a ill will towards the movement per se. I just haven't done it. Yeah. So I maybe need to, I think a lot of people like look at it as there's a lot of stress on the shoulder joint with it. Mm-hmm. But I think if you can correct the form pretty well, it is a, Pretty nice movement. Yeah. I would say that's a, a number of movements where it's like people are concerned with possible injury, but it's more often that they're just not doing the movement yeah. right. Okay. So when it comes to let's let's change the archetype and and talk about from a female perspective, same situation. They need to bring up their delts to get to that next level that they're trying to uh, make happen. Where do you start with them? That's where I'll put delts 
uh, not just on upper days, but okay. they will start to do some volume on lower days. Okay. I like to, I like to look at like lagging body parts in a way of where can I fit them in without too much fatigue. So I like lower volume in the actual session, but more frequency throughout the week because I feel like they can still recover pretty well from that. Uh, and I also like putting like the delts on the lower days to just break up the monotony of the the lower body the whole entire time. Okay. And I think it also for my girls too, like for some of the girls that I've coached, they enjoy doing upper stuff, right? So a lot of girls are, you know, now doing a lot of programs that are like zero upper at all, right? They have just lower body, lower body, lower body. I do think it's nice to have the delts on lower days too for them just to break up the monotony too. Is it different for, because you work with bikini, you work with wellness, you work with with figure. Yeah, I work with I've, everyone. Yeah, yes. I, have, I have women's bodybuilders, I have women's physique, yeah. figure, right? I've worked with wellness bikini for a long time too. Uh, I would say it all change. It all changes. Uh, I feel like for the more muscular divisions, I'm treating the training more like a men's bodybuilder too. Uh, just because that X frame is still the idea for those divisions. I think for figure even more because like the delts are a very highlighted piece in, in those divisions. And then for like wellness and bikini, you know, especially in bikini, we're looking for that hourglass shape. So similar to an X, but just like a little bit wider, a little tighter on the lat coming into the hip. Uh, so I will say I get more like pressing movements and like women's physique figure bodybuilding, right? Treat them like a, like an actual muscle that's going to go through compounds. But with bikini and wellness, I'd say more so just a lot of accessory work to just get the volume throughout the week. Now you've talked about frequency being a, a main driver here. Um, when we talk about training frequency, how are we addressing the intensity within the sets that are being performed? Because to have the frequency, you've got to have this under control or it's yeah. really not going to work out. So I, I, <clears throat> so I used to train with RIR a lot. Okay. I think on paper, it's really nice, but in practice it struggles, right? It's very hard for people to gauge like what an actual two RIR is. Uh, you know, I'd give videos and be like, dude, this is like a four five, six RIR. Like that's not a two. Um, but for a while, that's how I programmed. Then I started to see the errors, right? The user errors with it. So now I kind of will use like RPE scales because it's a little bit easier to understand, uh, especially like when I give them the, like, you know how they have it, like you can't say a sentence like right. that. Yeah, I'll do things like that where now the body parts that have more frequency instead of like an RPE of 10, maybe we're doing an RPE of like eight. Uh, and then I do just purposely keep the work volume down. Like maybe they're only doing one top set that day and that's it. But that's because tomorrow they might do their rear delt. And then the next day they might do something else just to control, like you said, the fatigue throughout the week because there's so much frequency. So are they are they training very much to failure when it comes to their delt training? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, would you say that you are able to program more sets to failure because of it being a smaller muscle group? Or is there any reason as to why you feel that you're able to take it more sets to failure with delts and, and specifically? I think they recover pretty well. Okay. I think they recover pretty fast too. Yeah. Um, that's one thing that like, I feel like smaller muscle groups can do that. But I think with the failure training, kind of what I tell people to do is work to a grinder that doesn't break your form. Okay. So I guess you could argue is that really true failure, right? At that point, if they're going to a grinder that's like just about to break their form, that's where I want them to stop. Right. You could technically probably get some force reps out of that with somebody helping you or something. But that's where like my threshold of like, that's where I want you stopping is, which I think helps a lot with a fatigue thing, too. Uh, that's why I think they get away with a lot of frequency. I do this for everybody. Part yeah. two. Yeah. It, it, with failure, there's just so many different categories of what failure can yeah. be. And it's like you have absolute failure to where you just if you were doing lateral raises, you can't even move the weight from your hip. But we also have failure in which we have a breakdown in form of getting to that complete range of motion. But we also have an in-between of like we're taking it to partials. Yeah. And so there's a big kind of gap or window that we can have as considered failure. And each of them are going to have their own varying degree of overall fatigue. If you were to be pushing your sets of lateral raises, every single one of them to the point where you cannot lift your arms from your hip, 
the frequency is probably not going to be the best avenue for you. But if you're taking them to more of a technical failure of just getting to the full range of motion, frequency is probably still going to work nicely. So I would say then to answer your question, I probably assign more technical failure yeah. than I do absolute failure. Okay. Um, a lot of that, honestly, I think is because of just ex like just watching video over time, over all these years, how hard it is for people to go to actual real failure without really overcompensating in other areas. Now, all of a sudden, their trap is on fire because they're still trying to go. But I, I rather just stop, rest, and then try another set at that point. Absolutely. I'm with you on that. So we we talked a little bit about the men's physique and the commonplace that you see uh, being a problem, being the anterior delt. With your female competitors, if it if it's different per division, definitely highlight that. But what's the area in which they are not seeing are they needing the most love i would say i would say the like rear delt but you know the thing the thing with it is the thing with it the division is changing so much mm -hmm. like a couple of years ago like you wanted like a softball delt right yeah. now it's like we don't want you that hard we don't want you to have big delts anymore so it's kind of hard to gauge, but I would say the rear delt is something that doesn't get enough love, um, especially because a lot of programs, they just have like one thing, like a reverse fly or a bent over dumbbell fly or something like that. I do think that's where like you could get some good crossover with back training, though. Higher, you know, higher stance elbow rows, rows that are really retracting, you know, not so much depressing. Uh, I think with the bikini, I think, you know, the rear delt something that gets neglected a decent bit because they think they're hitting it enough. I would say a lot of people though are also hitting their rear delts a lot with what they think is their back training. Yeah. Just for the sheer fact of not knowing how to go about their back training. And so then they end up just getting a shitload of rear delts. Yeah. And it's like, well, my rear delts are popping. I don't have any actual rear delts in my programming, so I don't need to continue to work on it. And then they may get to a place where it's like, oh, I, f I figured out how to train my lats. I figured out how to train other portions of my back. And now my rear delts are kind of falling behind or whatever the case may be. Well, that's why I think like when you, like for me, at least when I program like back days, I'm a little careful with how much like retraction focus stuff I put because okay. a lot of people do retract really hard with their shoulders first mm -hmm. and not so much like with their actual shoulder blade like right. you know uh and like that's why like if I ever whenever I am posting a training video <laughs> uh, I always make sure to like break down a back movement because I feel like back is one of those things that people have the hardest time actually engaging with yeah like properly depressing your scapula before you start rowing mm -hmm. right a lot of people don't do that they end up over protracted and then they pull and it's just like all of a sudden this re your shoulder moves the thing right so yeah I think the rear delt thing is a problem with back training actually low reps is best high reps is best fruit is so it's good it's terrible you, for you should lift at high reps carbs low are weight. needed Keto squats for are bad for your squats needs. are great you should squat astrograph it's fine it fits my macros for idiots. when there are so many mixed messages going around it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on but that's exactly where physique development one-on-one -on -one coaching comes in you might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your your life into consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. Coming back to the, the program design, do you when we're looking at the structure of, of a training session, we talked about the push sessions, we talked about the pulls, and then maybe having a full arm day. If delts are a large priority for your male or female, do you prefer to put them at the beginning of sessions? Do you put them at the end? Do you kind of mix them no, in? No, so if it's like uh, the main focus, it'll be first. Okay. Uh, one thing I've noticed at least, uh, I don't know if this is something you've experienced too, but let's say there's biceps on the day. I like to have the shoulders done before the biceps because people start to get some like uh, shoulder flexion with some of their curls. Mm -hmm. And then that bicep tendon fatigue, trying to go do shoulders after that. I've noticed people have a hard time. Uh, that's something that I experienced too. Like I just, I have to do my shoulder stuff before I do any type of bicep stuff. Interesting, okay. Um, 
And that's one of the things that I consider another thing is if it's like a real priority, it'll be first. And I, I like shoulder compounds too. I'm a big fan of a shoulder okay. press, like a nice, a, a good shoulder press that keeps you kind of far back, not behind your neck, but I would say alongside your ears, if anything. Okay. Uh, Cause I've noticed, I've noticed huge growth in shoulders like that. Barbell, uh, dumbbell machine. Uh, so my personal favorite is a cable, like, but a lot of gyms don't have it. It's actually like a cable where you have the handles like kind of like at your hip height uh -huh. and then you can grab them and press right over your head like this. There's a hoist machine that's like that. Yeah, hoist okay. does. Hoist has one. Life Fitness has one. Uh, and then I like a plate loaded like press like Arsenal is a good one. OK. Uh, Atlantis has a phenomenal one. I'm not sure I'm familiar. Yeah. I'm trying to think. Uh, Primes is pretty good, too. I'd say it's a little wide for some people because yeah. it's like stacked out here. Uh, who else has a techno gym has a really good one too. So I like the plate loaded presses. Um, I like the, I like the cables and I'm a big fan of like a higher incline, uh, press. Yeah. Where like you could get some good clavicle, like, uh, chest work, but you also get a good bit of like anterior delt in yeah. it too. And I usually do that on a Smith for people. Okay. So if we look at the most common errors that, that people make within their delt training, if you were to name like the first three that come to your mind, what would those be? I would say... And we've talked about them a little bit already. Yeah, you, you incorrect touched on a couple. La uh, lateral raises. Okay. So the what's the most ending, common error? There? Hands ending up higher than the elbow. Okay. Uh, I think people try to pull two, two, two to their side right. when you should be kind of pulling a little bit forward too. Like a good setup is behind, like cables behind you, but instead of going directly out, you're going like a, out and forward. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a huge mistake a lot of people make. I think from, obviously we talked about the upright rows already. That's a big one too. I think uh, people who do like dumbbell presses tuck a little too much mm. and they need to be a little bit more open. Like, it's nice to be tucked and braced, but I feel like some people end up a little bit too tucked. And that's one mistake that I find in a lot of people's pressing. And they're like, I don't know why my upper chest is on, you know, I feel, I'm feeling this a lot in my upper chest. Take a look at their video and it's just like, they're just a little too tucked and like sternum forward. So they're leading a lot with their chest on the press. Okay. That's one mistake I see a good bit too. So the, the with the first mistake, I agree with you for the the lateral race. It's one of those things that uh, we talk about it being in the scapular plane and the easiest way to kind of figure this out for yourself is that if you raise your arm out in front of you and then you raise it out to the side, kind of the middle point between those two points is probably is where you, should be where you pulling, need to be. Yeah. And with the cables being behind you, it almost forces you to find that spot. So that's why it works out nicely. There's also... Um, um, I have some some friends on on social that they'll call them crotch lateral raises where they have like the cable running between their legs and it lines up just as well. Oh, yeah. Um, may not work for everybody. And, you know, uh, the friends that I'm thinking of right this moment that say that they all have their own personal gym. So I don't know if you, <laughs> you want to be doing it at a public gym, maybe. I don't know. Um, but that would be something I agree with for sure. And we talked about the upright row. And then with the pressing, I can also agree with that where people will tuck too much. And it also just gets them into a place where they're not overly stable and they're having to like pull the dumbbells too far out in front of them to where they're not able to continue to overload the exercise yeah. and having to you know, be adjusted within their, their execution to even continue with the movement pattern in that way. So having the kind of middle point again, kind of in that same similar thought process of the scapular plane, it being the elbow positioning falls in that same spot to where they're able to get the most length to that anterior delt in the press, but also being able to be in the safest spot when we talk about ligaments and things of that nature in the shoulder complex. Yeah, because that's, I think, is a good point because like the shoulder joints the most mobile joint. So it's also the most prone to injury. <laughs> right. Yeah, that That's the other thing too, is we talked about the, the depression and, and shoulder movement in a row, for an example. And I think one thing that people get so caught up in is that they try to keep this depressed down the entire time. And it's like, well, bro, you're the head of your humerus and that scapula, they've got to move together. Yeah. Like those pieces have to work as one unit to a degree. Right. And so if we're trying to pin down that scapula and just have it there, but also have the humerus be able to like do its function, it's like, well, that's just going to pull away and it's not, you, you're going to get a lot of sensation per se, but it's also going to be something where it's like, we need to be able to fluently move so that the, the muscle can lengthen, shorten, do everything that needs yeah. to do. 
And, and I think, I think what a lot of people do is they they tend to, I think a lot of people tend to like overreach and overstretch, which is fine as long as you re-engage correctly, mm-hmm. right? A lot of people don't re-engage correctly, and then they pull from here. Right, and they're kind of shrugged and they're up, kind they're getting of, yeah. tension to their neck. Exactly. It's something where they're like really bunched up, getting a lot of elbow flexion, and it's like, you should be able to look at this video and be like, this is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but instead, you send it, and you're like, what? What? Are, what? why am I not feeling this? Then I'm the bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> that happens. That really happens. Uh, so I, I, I guess my, my next question beyond that is, let's say that you have a client that you have implemented these things and you're six months into the process and their delts still haven't gotten the love. And it's like, bro, your, your delts are still behind. What are the, what are the things that you're looking at within their, whether it be their program design, their execution, um, within their nutrition supplementation, whatever the case may be, what are the things that you're looking at and being like, okay, this was the, this is where we've kind of had a, uh, an issue, or this is my priority list that I go through of checking these things off to see why we haven't had the result that we've wanted. Yeah. So I, I obviously start like with the frequency. That's usually my first thought process on a lagging part. Um, so like, let's say that wasn't really working after six, eight months, I'll probably reduce the frequency, increase volume in sessions that are more specific to just the delt. Okay. Uh, so maybe like take away the delt work on the lower day, right? And now it's more volume on the upper day and having maybe an intensifier now that day and doing like a rest pause or a drop set, something of that nature, because maybe what's happening is they're not, th- because of the frequency, they're not reaching like stimulus thresholds mm-hmm. because of that. I see. So. I think that's something that you kind of start to see with people who have a hard time training hard. They just have a hard time getting their mind to do some of that. And if the frequency is maybe too much, those 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 sessions at the end of the week are probably not right. really doing much for them. So pulling back from those, adding some of that volume back to the other sessions, and then maybe putting intensifiers like a rest pause, a drop set. I like rest pauses a lot, so. Okay, that was that was gonna be my next question was uh, your thoughts on intensifiers, things like drop sets, cluster sets. Um, do I have any others? Yeah, drop sets, cluster sets, Little super sets, <laughs> rest pause. <laughs> do you have a favorite of those? Uh, I like rest pauses a lot. Okay. I like doing, I like doing rest pauses, I think, because it gives people the opportunity to not have a lot of junk volume in okay. their training. Uh, again, another thing I learned from Mike uh, was just you can get rid of a lot of junk volume, I think, with a rest pause. Like I've had some people in the past where they're doing you know, their own programming, like it's not something they signed up with me with. And I'm taking a look and it's like they're doing four working sets on a movement. I'm like, there's a lot of junk probably in these sets. So let's drop you to two on your last one, do a rest pause. Uh, and then they start feeling it more. They're sore, right? And then now we're seeing more stimulation. So I like rest pauses a lot. I like to drop sets too. Okay. Cluster sets are fun too. Um, fun. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, Widowmaker's like DC training. Mm-hmm. Those are those are intense. Those are really good for like leg training, in my opinion, to keep set volume down, but like really, really push a threshold. Um but I and I think what intensifiers help with is now the set said the other movements that don't have intensifiers, that person is getting more and more familiar with what intensity is. And it kind of trickles into their other movements because of that. Yeah, I can agree with that. So when you are using the intensifiers, how do you implement them into the program design? Like, is there they're in this stimulus for let's say two to four weeks and then in weeks five and six they start to use the intensifiers or how do you do that so uh, if we're going off like the first example like somebody's not seeing the good progress with the frequency i will just start them on the the intensifiers right away i'll explain what they are if they don't know what they are uh and then that's kind of gonna that's gonna be our video feedback for a while like i want to see these sets i want to keep seeing these sets so that we can get good feedback, see where they're messing up, right? Because rest pauses are also hard. So then I don't want to see like a break in form still. Uh, and, you know, just adjusting that and figuring that out. 
So I'd say it's like almost immediate. It's just right away. I don't like alchemate them up to that, but I think it's, uh, I mean, I think it, it translates into some pretty good, pretty good results. Yeah. So how do you, is there a, a threshold of time that you'll keep them utilizing those intensifiers and then be able to deload per se yeah. or? Yeah, I, I do a lot of that based off feedback, just communication. Okay. I don't like program pre-planned deloads or anything like that. It's a big communication thing with me. Like part of my check-in like process, there's like a decent section for training and I'm actually, I've actually added to it now. So off of that will kind of be where I'm gauging things. And then if I start noticing like mental fatigues coming in more, doms are coming in more, all these things are starting to come in. Uh, that's when we just kind of have a conversation. And I'll tell them I'm a big fan of just not training. So okay. it's like take the next four to five days off go do some normal life stuff, Yeah, catch up on some things you need to catch up on, and then we can get back into training. Okay. So I, I, I had mentioned supersets. Do you use them much within your delt training? I, I don't use them at all. Really? Yeah. Are you a hater of them? No, or? honestly, I'm not. I just uh, I just really haven't programmed with supersets in a long, long time. Interesting. I, I don't think they're not – I, I don't think there's anything wrong with them. I think they're great. I should take that back. I, I do supersets for like lifestyle clients. My competitors, not so much. Okay. Supersets, I think, are good for people pressed with time, you know, who have maybe a little bit harder time pushing the intensity. So the fatigue's a little bit higher because of the superset. They get to that threshold of effort a little bit faster. Um, so I, I, I would say for the competitors, I don't really do it. But for lifestyle, I still use them. So can you expand on more maybe why you don't use them with competitors? I think with the competitor having the supersets sometimes mentally for them, they don't give the first exercise their all mm. because they know they have to do the second exercise right after. Okay. Uh, I think it holds back a little bit for the first exercise because of that. Okay. I can see that. I can see that certainly. I, I think supersets have their their place, but it's it's needing to be very specific within the programming and it's also individual to the person. Yeah. Of like how much time do we have? I think the time constraints is the large part. And then also with the superset, how is it impacting the like if you have two exercises, we say what is is happening for like is the muscle in the second exercise being impacted by the first and if they are individual from one another that's going to be great from a time perspective because you're probably not going to have fatigue carry over into that second exercise outside of cardiovascular demands and if you're that out of shape to be able to do a dumbbell lateral raise into a cable curl for example it's pr you're you got more issues yeah. than, you know, getting to failure in a cable So do curl. you like doing supersets with antagonizing muscles? Or? Um, so I'm not, so it, it really depends on the movements. I'm, I'm big on like a later in the session, if we can get more bang for our buck, at, like with, let's say we've had a, a lower body session, we've crushed, um, we've crushed split squats. We've crushed a hinge of some sort. We've had a, um, a, a squat, for an example, we've had three movements that are really challenging and we want to get in leg extensions, leg curls, 45 degree hip extension, a glute kickback, for example, those movements I may be able to pair if they are not impacting one another okay. so that we can get more overall volume in place and, um, but still be conservative with our time. Yeah. It's like, if we're already going to be resting from a glute med kickback, but we need to get leg extensions in as well. We And it's, you know, they're capable of doing it in their gym. Why don't we just go ahead and knock that out yeah. so we can be more efficient from a time Yeah, I can see that for sure. Yeah. I For time uh, time constraint issues too, that's why I like using rest pauses. Okay. Like I'll tell people do a double rest pause. Right. Right. You're going to do one top set, but there's a double rest pause attached to it. And I feel like that's for some people enough to push them to their threshold to just move on to the next thing. Yeah. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing? Turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s able to grow their glutes 
with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program. Because you are awesome and I want you to have this program, I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. So when it when we, we're talking a little bit about volume right now, um, when you are establishing, let's say a new client comes to you, are you, do you have like a, a set amount of volume? We're talking about having a muscle group that's a focus. Yeah. Is there a set amount of of sets that you're trying to accomplish to get them started as this is like your base volume so that I can see you progress over time? So like a new client comes to me, training is going to be very, very like, I guess the word would be like, minimalized yeah. because I need to get a lot of feedback before I customize. Uh, that's just my thought process. Like how, I can't really customize something on you and I know nothing about you yet. Right. So I would say like my volume is if I, I could just use like a rough number. Like if I, let's say I do three chest movements on a chest on a push day, there's maybe two working sets each six total sets. We're doing that twice a week. So around 12 sets, right? Okay. Um, that then will change based on feedback, uh, based on video. Maybe this movement just is not your movement. We need to do a different machine. We need to do a different kind of press or something like that. So I would say it starts very minimalized so that I can then customize. And then from that feedback, now I will just kind of gauge how they're doing. And then, you know, diets, drugs. Right. Now volume volume becomes a game when you're dealing with that stuff too. Yeah, yeah it, the, the game changes there for sure. And, and I'm similar to you where I, I have more of a, a general set and then we're able to kind of go off of that. Yeah, I'll pull from their previous training and then if they're able to provide training videos of themselves of like, I ask for movements in which they're training to failure or what their perceived failure to look like. So I get a, a feel for what does this volume actually look like in practice? Because you can have someone come to you and say, I trained a failure every single set. <laughs> and they send it and you're like, oh, buddy, I think you're about three or four reps shy of failure yeah. with a lot of these. And um, that in that scenario, especially from a research standpoint, we know that if, we, if we're going to be at a lower RP threshold, we just need more overall volume. And then if we go the opposite direction of training much closer to failure consistently, can we less. can use less. And so it's like, I go off of that scale and kind of have a window in which I, I follow there for particular muscle groups um, that I use and then kind of titrate depending on what the feedback's been. Yeah. So we're on a similar page. Yeah. Now. I mean, I I like that you said that about like people who just can't get there. And yeah. So you have to use a little bit more volume because I do, I think there's a lot of people who program training that are like, no, you have to teach them how to train to right. failure. But I think for some people that's unattainable. Right. It's Wait. or it's very, very it's gonna take a long time to teach them that. Yeah. So we have to figure out how do we reach our threshold somehow. Yeah. And I think that's one of the biggest downfalls of some coaches is that they are like, this is the way to do it. Yeah. And you've got to do it this way. It's like, dude, you gotta meet the person where they're at. And then if you think that this is the only way to do it, you've got to get them to that point. It's not like they're here and all of a sudden they're just going to jump to here because now they're working with you. You've got to teach to get to that. And so I'll, I'll program, like if I have someone coming to me that really has a very poor understanding of, of intensity, like you could look at that program and be like, dude, you are crushing them with volume. It's like, uh, you got to talk to the person. Just let me context. show you some video. Yeah, let me show you some videos. And this will make sense to you why I have yeah. a crushing amount of volume relative to my other athlete who has significantly less. And, you know, it's just, it is so individually dependent and that gets lost, especially from a programming perspective, because I think too many people are just like, this is the one way and everybody needs to train this exact way. Yeah. Uh, uh, Austin Stout posted something the other day. It's a little bit off topic, but it's, uh, he posts just about the context of the person. Yeah. You don't, you can't say something's right or wrong if you have no context. Yeah. And that's, that's the problem with a lot of 
our industry. Oh, 100%. <laughs> and especially when someone goes from having a coach to a new coach and then they provide them with, these are the things that I was, I was taking or these are the things that I was doing from a program perspective without any context. It's like that coach who you're now coming to is like, oh, this is, this is wrong or you should have done it this way. It's like, well, you don't have the full, like you're yeah. getting literally one part of the story from one, you know, side of it all. And, uh, that's always something that needs to be, I, I learned that over time. Cause I, I remember early on coaching, I would look at things and be like that coach, I can't believe they did it. And then it, it would happen to me. I'm like, that's not what the reality was. Yeah. <laughs> and so you kind of learn in that process of, um, experience and, and those different factors. The last thing I'll ask you when it comes to Delta, and I've got a, a couple of questions, just being a dad and being able to get your training in for yourself. I want to have a little bit of time to finish up there, but the last thing I'll ask you with, with Delts, is there any myths around Delt training that you would highlight of like, this is ridiculous. I can't believe people think this. Man, um, myths about delt training. It's a very specific question. That is a very specific question. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think of what stupid stuff I've seen on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's, like, I mean, there's like people who argue like a cable pullover is a rear delt machine. Like, oh, really? Like, yeah. Like, I've seen a video on that before. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, no, this is a rear delt movement. I'm like, I don't think so, I don't dude. Think so. Um, I mean, that's one. I, I don't know. I, I, well, I can't I guess, recall I guess you one. kind of talked on a couple. Is like we could call the aspect of with your pressing and not needing to do any anterior oh, okay, delt work. Yeah. If we want to call that a myth, like you would say. That I'd that's, say that's like a bro science-y thing. Yeah, bro science-y thing. As well as the, the upright rows. That was another one you kind of yeah. talked about. I wouldn't call it a myth, but it's certainly something. A misunderstanding. A misunderstanding there for sure. I was, as I was typing that out, I was like, what myths do I think about, uh, delt training? And I don't know if there's like a specific myth. I think the, the one thing is that people, um, not necessarily a myth, but things that people screw up is that they put delts at the end of their sessions. Mm -hmm. And then it's just like very lackluster work that they're putting in. And then they want to complain that their delts aren't growing. And it's like, bro, you literally, it's like an afterthought. It's similar to like the calf work and those yeah. different things. It's just, if you really want to see change, making sure that it's truly a priority within your program design or you're maintaining focus from start to finish of your session. Yeah. No, that's a good one too. Yeah. So I guess that's, I mean, if you guys have any, as you're listening to this and there's myths that you're curious about or things that you've heard, drop them in the comments, um, or shoot us a, an email, a DM something, and, uh, we'll, we'll talk about them. But as a dad, you have had to obviously change your training. How much of a difference has it been from not being a dad to being a dad and like the training? Uh, so my son is two now. Okay. And I would say probably the first seven to eight months of him being alive, I probably trained like once a week. Man. Yeah. Tough. So I went from like five days a week, consistent, right? I was competitively bodybuilding at the time. We had him still try, was trying to keep it going. That lasted like a month maybe. And then after that, it was like one, two times a week maybe mm -hmm. for a while. Uh, and now I'm a big proponent and I really try to preach it to people like new coaches, new parents, like don't let your own fitness become a sacrifice uh, because at the end of the day, I need to be healthy. I need to be here too now, right? Especially when it, it changes, I think when you have a kid, right? When you get married, it's like, well, she could take care of herself if something happens to me, right? Now there's this little human that I yeah. need to take care of and I need to provide for support. Right. So now my, I mean, my thought process on that is like, you know, prioritize your health because it's not your health anymore. It's, it's for them. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, so now I make sure to train really early, like five thirty, six in the morning. And then I usually start my day like at seven and that's, uh, that's been going really well. Um, which doesn't interrupt any of my time with him which is nice, right? My wife's sleeping too. She doesn't go to work till like eight. I'm already gone. He doesn't wake up till like eight. So I don't miss any like time with them because then I'm finishing work and I can just go home. That that schedule control I think is really important too. Okay. But I do think there is a little bit of push and shove. Like you're not going to have the most perfect balance. You're not going to be able to like see him every single night. 
do bedtime and because you've missed your training in the morning. And I think we try to, I think when people try to like have the perfect balance of it all, everything starts to suffer because of it. So I think there's a little bit of give and take and I'm at a point where I feel really comfortable with the give and take because I get to spend a lot of time with him and then I get to also get all my training done too. Okay. How was the, uh, how was the mental challenge going from competitive bodybuilding training very consistently to having him in that seven month window where I'm sure at the beginning you were like, I'm still going to make this work. Yeah. And so you had those first, at least the first few weeks or if maybe months of like, damn, bro, I'm trying to get in there and do this, but I'm only getting in one time. Like how yeah. was that mentally? No, it's frustrating. Yeah. Like it's, it, it was very frustrating, which then started to just, that frustration bleeds out into everything. Right. Right then you're getting irritated, you're working faster so that you can go, you know, I'd say probably a little bit of my quality at work even fell because of it too. Okay. Uh, but then I just came to a realization that like, th this probably isn't the right time for me to keep competitively bodybuilding. So I'm going to put that to the side because that's not what makes my money. That's not what puts food on our table. <laughs> so I'm going to kind of take a step back from that. Right. Uh, and then just I, for me, at least having a kid really changed my mindset on the whole thing. Because like when, <laughs> when he was born, I was like 220. Like, okay. I'm five foot six. <laughs> like, you know, I was I was decently big and like s breathing hard, sleep apnea. Like your, your mindset shifts a lot. Right. Um, at least it did for me. I mean, I know there's plenty of guys who have kids and it, you know, hasn't changed their mindset on anything. But for me, it did a lot. And then I just decided to put the competitive bodybuilding away for good. Understandable. Um, so with your with your training now, how frequently are you training? And then you said it's worked out better for you to be training in the morning. I, I go five days a week. So okay. I'll do a push pull. I'll do a push pull. I'll do a leg. I'll do a shoulders and arms. And then that other session will be either another push or another pull. Okay. Just kind of like what's not hurting. That <laughs> <laughs> is there any, uh, now that you've made this transition, found a good groove, is there specific goals that you have within your training at the moment? Uh, I wouldn't say specific goals. I, I, I mean, a goal that's always been one of mine that's important is just staying strong. Okay. Like I, I do still pull from the ground. I want to be strong in a lot of certain things. Um, so that's a big goal still is just holding a lot of my strength. I think like pulling from the ground is important. I think squatting is important. I think doing things that allow you to be really stable and bracing and have good strength is good. Grip strength is also hugely correlated to a lot of things, especially in research. So I think, uh, making sure like my back movements stay pretty strong too. Uh, I think strength is probably like the one thing I'm the most focused on right now. So Really, I don't train with crazy high volume with like the goal of like shaping and creating. It's more get in, do the do the steak and potato movements and just stay strong at them. Yeah. Do you have like a set time that you're in there or do you give yourself just get everything done and then I'll get home when I get home? Uh, just get everything done, really. And I'd say my sessions are like probably 45 minutes. Yeah, not bad. Yeah, not bad. Is the is the crowd that early at lifetime? What's that? Is it packed? It's a or? mix. It's like. You get like the old people and then you get the really like meathead ready to go. Oh, really? Yeah. And then uh, other than that, though, it's pretty, it's not bad. Not bad. I'm never waiting for something. Yeah. Which is nice. Is there a, um, if you could give, let's say two to three pieces of advice for new dads within their training and their nutrition, like full spectrum, what are the few things that you would share with them? Uh, I would say... It can get hard to make sure you're eating consistently, especially like if if you're watching the kid, if your wife's gone, if your partner's gone, like and you just are now like you have to like watch them for X amount of hours, like making sure you're still eating, I think is a huge thing for a while. I wasn't doing okay. like I would miss meals. I'd miss I'd even I wouldn't even remember to eat sometimes just because like I'm trying to take care of him while she's, you know she's sleeping, recovering from this childbirth, right? Like, so there's all, there's that, the eating is an aspect huge. Um, and honestly, to be honest, is reduce the frustration. Cause mm -hmm. like when you have a newborn and you have a young kid, your patience will be tested. Oh, I'm sure. And, but it's a testing that it's out of your control. 
I think when a lot of people get frustrated in situations like that, it's because they're trying to control an uncontrollable. Right. A one year old has no idea what you're telling them. Yeah. Right. There's you know, a certain degree of communication, but it's very <laughs> limited. Right. <laughs> I think then that frustration will like derail people, put them into like unhealthy stress induced behavior changes. So that's one thing that like for me, I'm really big on that. Like I'm really big on if he's crying in the middle of the night, like I don't have a right to get mad about that. Right. But a lot of people do. And then they're up all night and that ruins their day the next day and so on and so forth. So the patience would be a huge thing okay. with it. So patience, make sure you get make your sure meals. Make sure you're eating, yeah. Anything else? Um, I mean, for me, what I preach to people is your food's more important than your training. Okay. I would rather you miss a training session than eat really badly all day long. Okay. That's kind of what I tell people. Yeah. Well, sweet. I mean, that... <laughs> That was, a, that was a good episode. I was very happy with just everything we got to share with everybody. Is there anything else you would like to tell the audience about from a DELT training perspective or from a parent trying to <laughs> stay as jacked and strong as possible? I think I covered it all. I think you covered it yeah. all? Very nice. All right. Well, thank you so much for thank coming on. Thank you for on. having me. Yeah. I very appreciative you came on. And, and make sure you guys, we've got everything in the show notes for Dom, um, his Instagram. Um, what else will we have? Instagram. Just Instagram. Just Instagram. We're trying to get Dom to do more content. So <laughs> you guys badger him more to have yeah. more things specifically uh, that you guys want to learn about. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure that you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you in the next episode.